This podcast is part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club, a program designed to help all podcasts reach their full potential. For information about joining the Robots Radio Rocket Club, check out robotsradio.net. Hey, all you heroes and champions, crows, pirates, and inquisitors. Welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast. I'm Shelby. And I'm Austin. And we are so excited to bring you this podcast. Every episode, we'll be talking about a different topic in the Dragon Age universe. From the Maker to Lyrium to Aravels, we will cover it all. There will be spoilers. And always remember, swooping is bad. Hello and welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast, where we talk about all things Dragon Age related and its lore. I am one of your hosts, Teacup. Or Austin, and I'm here with my other host. I am She Cup or Shelby, and I am the kind of lore nerd person for this show. Yeah, so we are ready for our episode. We're kind of getting back to like the theme of this season because we did our patron episode and then we did a character deep dive. And so we're back to our theme of spirits, demons, magic. Oh my. And so what are we talking about today? Yeah, so today we're kind of introducing and talking about what demons and spirits are like at their core and what they do and all that kind of stuff. We started this last week with Cole because Cole, the companion, he is a spirit. So we kind of talked about spirits a little bit last week, but this week we're really going to do a deep dive into what they are, how they come about, all of that kind of stuff. So you ready for some fun facts? What would you do if I told you I didn't have any fun facts? I'd be a little sh- concerned and I might come into the room where you are to make sure that you're not an imposter. Um, well, I do have fun facts. So the point is mood. So let's just start at their core. Both spirits and demons are inhabitants of the fade. We sometimes call them fade creatures. Spirits typically appear to be like glowing Um, sometimes outlines of what you think like a human elf, Kunari or dwarf would look like, whereas demons, um, they typically aren't glowing and they typically also look kind of monstrous. Like they, they aren't something you would encounter normally. They look like something that is going to hurt you. Um, and they are. So spirits also tend to have very short or even non-existent memories, which makes Solus's side quest very interesting since uh, the spirit in that side quest, it, it remembers him. So that's interesting. Outside of the Fae, like when a spirit takes the form of a human, it's indistinguishable from a human. So it's biologically indistinguishable too. It it looks as if it would be a human. So you can't really even tell just by looking at them is kind of the point of that fun fact. Um, And then I think this next one is really, really, really important. Spirits have the ability to read other people's emotions and their thoughts. And that is, that's why Cole acts the way he does because he can read everyone's emotions and thoughts at least before he is made like more human if you choose that in his quest yeah i was just gonna say this kind of opens up that because a spirit is indistinguishable from the human or whoever they're imitating perhaps perhaps there is no anders in da2 so you think it's just justice i think it's possible so what would have happened to the real anders maybe sometime between awakening and DA2, he died and justice took over. But wouldn't the body like be decaying if that was the case? I guess that's true because justice is possession of what's his face. His body is decaying. Right, Kristoff. Yeah, Kristoff. So I don't know. It's just a thought. Definitely interesting. So um, just a couple more fun facts. In Tevinter and in Navara, but especially in Tevinter, they often bind spirits and use them as servants. So in Dragon Age Origins Awakening, Justice claimed that his Lyrium ring, which is a gift from the Warden Commander, has a beautiful song that he wishes his spirit brethren were able to hear. Justice's unique ability to equip the ring also implies, along with this conversation, that spirits are resistant to the effects of Lyrium. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And then lastly is that demons and spirits, but especially demons, they don't really have genders. Um, in the fade, they are able to shape shift and take any form of their own choosing. They can do this at will all the time, even. And because they live in this kind of alternate reality, a demon's like natural mindset and this like ability to shape shift and change all the time, it might seem almost crazy to us or to to the people in the game but to them it's just natural it's just how they operate so they don't really have a shape or form that's even intrinsic to them they can just kind of choose whatever they want to be it's interesting so desire demons are choosing to look like that right you could say that or you could be honest with yourself and and understand that bioware did that in a different time (laughs) I mean, there aren't desire demons like that in Dragon Age Inquisition. So at at some point, they made a conscious choice to change that design. Right. Well, and like, I think you told me Dorian says that desire demons appear male to him. Yeah, I think he does say that. I don't know. Anyway. I don't have any other thoughts about the uh, fun fact. So if you want to move on. Sure. So our next topic is kind of diving into what spirits really are. So in this episode, we will focus mostly on what we learn from the Chantry and from Solus. I know in other episodes, I've kind of broken it down like Chantry beliefs, Elven beliefs, Solus beliefs, Avar, like we've kind of gone through all of them. Um, But we don't really know enough about what everyone believes about all of these things. So we're just going to stick to the big two, which I think is the Chantry and what Solus says. We will talk about Avar stuff because I know they have a lot of different beliefs about spirits. We'll talk about them later um, in another season. So don't think we're just forgetting about them. We're not. But for this episode, we're going to focus on the Chantry and Solus. So According to the Chantry, spirits were the first children of the maker. We talked about this extensively in our very first episode. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and listen to that one before you finish this one. So ultimately, the maker turned his back on the spirits because they didn't create. And to be fair, they weren't created to create. The maker did not create spirits to be creative beings. They didn't have souls either. Instead, the spirit's only desire was really to impress the maker. And he quickly became tired of this and then created his new children, which supposedly is humanity. Now, remember, I'm not saying this as if it's fact. I'm saying this as from the perspective of this is what the Chantry teaches. So when the maker created his second children, the spirits watched with morbid curiosity. Most of them really coveted humanity because they're getting the attention from the maker that they wanted. However, they also didn't really understand or even want to be a part of humanity at that time. Also, kind of going off on a tangent a little bit, technically all citizens of the Fade are spirits. Um, So that means technically demons are spirits and any creature that you encounter in the Fade is a spirit. But that can get kind of confusing when a spirit becomes a demon. So anyway, so spirits, like we talked about with demons, demons being able to kind of choose their form. Spirits also are not restricted to a specific physical form, um, but they are, you know, intelligent creatures who are capable of speech and they can have a form if they want to, but they don't have to. But at the end of the day, they do lack a certain creativity and imagination. So regardless of if spirits are like on your side or not on your side, they will take your memories and thoughts and use them to mimic life in the fade, especially. And that's because they, they don't have that, like they don't have a life of their own. They, they don't like grow up and have families and get married and have jobs and have to fight dark spawn. Like that's not the life of a spirit. They take those memories and those actions from the player's life or a person's life in Thetis and then create their own kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's a mimic. It's, um, um, it is an imitation. It's not an authentic life in their own right. And so this um, is kind of what you experience 
in your dreams when you're in Thetis. So spirits are interacting with you and creating kind of these mimics of your life. And then that's kind of how they interact with you while you're sleeping. And then spirits though, even if they're not that creative, they can be very powerful. There are some who just rule the dream realm. And then there are others who have very little influence at all in anything. And then there are also wisps, which are not really even fully formed spirits at all who have no power over anything. So there is a wide range of power when it comes to the spirits. But at their core, spirits do crave to join the living and they want to join our world even if they don't necessarily want to become us, they still want to join the world. And they also spirits, if they do come to the world, they have, they struggle. They have challenges, understanding like static concepts like time. They kind of struggle with, with some of those sorts of things, because especially time, it doesn't, it doesn't work in the fade like it does in Thetis. So And then my last thing that I have to really talk about spirits is um, about their identities. So they're not complex beings like we, me and you, Austin and I, as well as your average everyday elf or human or Cunari or dwarf, like the people in Thetis are complex beings. They have multiple reasons for living. They have multiple things they want to do with life. Sometimes they have conflicting beliefs and ideologies and all kinds of things. They're fully formed human beings and people just like we are. Spirits, on the other hand, are not this way. They are not complex creatures. They tend to only have one reason for existence. For example, many spirits, they will choose one emotion or they will latch onto one aspect of worldly life. And that becomes their entire identity. They let this emotion or feeling completely consume their entire personality and their entire life. Then it becomes their reason for living and their purpose for life. For example, Anders' spirit of justice is so committed to gaining justice for the mages that this justice then turns into vengeance. Yeah, I think that it's interesting that the spirits, like they're created by the maker, and then he's just mad at them for acting the way they created. But I feel like it's more than that. It's like, it's almost like to me, it seems like a self projecting from the the chantry in a moment of like, oh, every reason like that we're not like the spirits, that's why the maker prefers us. You know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely like see their argument about the creativity aspect, but it it does very much seem, at least to me, their their arguments for why they're better than than spirits seem a little bit arbitrary. Like, what if the maker just created spirits to live in the fade and humans and whomever else they believe he created to live like in Thetis in the material world? And I know that there was the the whole veil issue, but I don't know. It just it seems to me like they don't have a lot of basis for this whole argument about, oh, well, we're the second children and, and we're really the preferred ones. So if we compare this to like the Genesis creation story, you know, it says that God and the heavenly host or whatever say, let us create humankind in our image. Like, so let us make them in the image of the divine. But in Threnodes, we don't really get that. I mean, I think it does say something about the image of the maker. I I think think it only says that about the humans, though. Like, it doesn't say that about... It doesn't say that about spirits, but, but even so, like all this stuff was, was written by the Chantry. Right. And that's my point. Like we don't even have like in Threnodes, we don't get any kind of like insight into the maker's motivation for creating the spirits, you know, whereas like when you look at an account like Genesis, especially Genesis two and three, you get this kind of notion that God creates for a purpose and like I'm thinking specifically for in Genesis 2 when God says you know it is not good for the human one or man to be alone 
so God creates woman or Eve, you know? So like, there's a sense of purpose, but like, there's no sense of purpose in the creation of spirits. And so to me, that reads as like, okay, you didn't really have an intention or anything when you created them, yet you have this expectation on them. And now you're mad at them for not living to that expectation. Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting to me how we come at it from two opposite perspectives, because you're very much like the person who is saying the baker is unfair, which I I don't disagree with. Um, And so you're thinking about that, but I'm thinking about like, okay, there's nothing really in the Chantry texts that like it was these, as far as I'm aware, these are written by the first divine. So like she could have just come up with all this stuff. You know, it's not like it was done by committee or even by like a group of people um, that passed it down over generations or even an oral tradition. Um, And so for me, that that makes it lose a lot of validity. And so for me, it just seems like the Chantry is basically um, what's the word? It's like it's kind of like the Chantry is just retconning their own history. Right. I can't remember. You would know more because it does. She write does divine uh justinia the first does she write the chant of light or is she translating it oh she wrote it um but it's been a while since i've dug into that research so i i might be wrong about that right and it comes back like that, that's a very real realistic you know thing about religious texts like for example you know jesus didn't write any of the gospels I really disagree with that statement. Yes, you're right. Jesus didn't write the gospels. That's true. But his disciples did. And the church, like the early church in that time, like they had an oral tradition. The Jewish religion had an oral tradition and they passed down these stories for generations. And people in our time, we often think, oh, an oral tradition, like that's just like the game of telephone it's very easily changed, but that's not actually true. The oral tradition actually tends to be a, an extremely accurate form of creating or maintaining stories through the generations because it's looked at as this is my sacred duty to pass on this story. And they don't change things extraneously like that, like we might think they would. So for me, as far as I'm aware, there's no claim of an oral tradition about the maker and the chantry's religion right well there ha- there has to be an oral tradition because there's so much time between justinia the first and andraste right i'm just saying we don't know about it right because neither draken or justinia the first knew andraste no i don't think so because yeah i mean you're right at least with the gospels like some of the writers of the text of the New Testament actually knew Jesus. Like they mm-hmm. knew him in the flesh. So right. that's a little different. So anyway, we're getting a little off topic, but I think now would be a great time for a break. Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Enchantment? Enchantment! You need me. Ugh. I am yours as always. All right, so welcome to the middle of the show where we talk about all things that have to do with the podcast, but not the lore. And so it's now the time that we love to thank our patrons, uh, our patrons of all tiers. We couldn't do this show without you. We really appreciate the support. And so I'm going to read the names of our patrons, our first couple patrons who get their names read out every show. So that is Lisa M, Genesis Derek B and Zuba. And we also have a new patron to shout out this week. Thank you Woo-hoo. so much to Crystal J for becoming our newest patron. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. And you too can sign up on our Patreon at various tiers to all kinds of benefits, add three versions of the show, all the way up to coming on to the episode with us at our tier three first enchanter patron tier. We did that episode about two weeks ago, and that was a lot of fun. And if you would like to join us, you can sign us up there. You can find the link in the episode. You can go in there and sign up and support us however you feel. Um, Another way to support us is to leave us a review on Apple or Spotify. You can rate us on Spotify. You can leave us a 
review with words on Apple. And if you do that, we will read it on a future episode of the show. I do not believe we have a review to read. We do not have a review to read. So the last thing that I want to tell you is about our Discord. You can come and join us and talk with us on the Discord. We have a lot of fun uh, there. We're trying to reach 100 members. So if you haven't joined yet, come and join the Discord. We are closing in on that 100 member mark. And we'd really appreciate having you there. We talk about Dragon Age. We talk about the Assassin's Creed lore cast. We talk about our Star Wars podcast. We talk about other games. You know, we la- a couple days ago, we were talking about how we could wish wish we could hang up on the elusive man from Mass Effect. And so that was a lot of fun. And we'd love to have anyone and everyone come join us on that server and have a lot of fun with us. That link is in the episode description. You can also find us on the Robots Radio server. If you're looking for more podcasts to listen to, that is the place to find video game podcasts. It is one of my favorite places on the internet. It's a great group of people, awesome podcasts, lots of content. You can basically find anything you want there. If you want to send us your protagonist, you can still do that via Discord or Twitter or email or however you want to do that. We'd love to see your protagonist, your heroes, Hawks and Heralds, and that would be awesome. I think that's it for the middle of the show. Well, that was uh, Orlesian. Dareth Shiran. You fear barbarians will swoop down upon you. Yes, swooping is bad. All right, well, are you ready to talk about demons? Let's do it. Okay, so I spent the first half of the episode talking about how spirits are typically non-aggressive and they're not malicious in nature. On the other hand, demons are. They are aggressive. They are malicious. They do typically want to do you harm. They also tend to embody what we would refer to as negative emotions. So demons are technically corrupted spirits or a spirit who has been denied its original purpose. So, for example, again, I'll use this example when justice is denied, it often becomes vengeance. And that's what happened. That's the story of Dragon Age 2. And we also see spirits turning into demons all the time. I mean, look at look at Solus's quest. This happens pretty frequently. So also, a demon's strength and intelligence are dependent on the emotions or the idea that it feeds from. So if you have a very complex concept, that demon is going to be very powerful. Whereas if you have a very simple emotion, you're going to have a less powerful demon. So to talk about that, go in a little bit more in depth. In the Towers Age, a human observer of demons named Brahm created a hierarchical scale for identifying demons. So we're going to go from weakest to strongest. So Bram or Brahm argues that rage is the simplest emotion to feed from. So rage demons are lowest on the power scale. Sloth demons are above rage demons a little bit, and they are known as masters of disguise. So the disguise concept makes them a little bit more complex than simple anger or rage. And then third, desire demons are higher still, and they have the power to manipulate people without them even knowing. So they're taking the disguise and taking it a step further into manipulation into convincing you and uh, manipulating you. So that is a level of complexity higher, again, than sloth demons. So that means desire demons are more powerful than sloth and rage demons. And then finally, the most powerful of all are pride demons. They are fearsome creatures known for their intelligence, and they are the most frightening of all the demons, and they are the most powerful of all the demons. So this scale comes from a codex entry, and it's not totally accurate since we know that there are more types of demons than just these four. A lot of the other demons do fall into one of these four categories, but not all of them. And we will talk about all of these demons in depth in coming episodes, but to kind of mention a few that aren't necessarily reflected in the scale that we do meet in the game. So the terror demons rely mostly on like base fear, whereas despair demons 
work to extinguish feelings of hope. So I would say that a terror demon is less complex than a despair demon. And then you also have really rare demons like fear demon or envy demon. And we're not really sure where those fit into the rankings, but I think those are both more complex than rage. That's for sure. So that's kind of one way to look at classifying demons. Do you have any thoughts about that? So I think about it in this, I would say that fear is probably the strongest demon. If I would have had to categorize it because of fear is such a primal thing to existence. Like in a simple way, like we need fear. Like we can't exist without it. Right. And like fear drives your instincts. Right. And like be, sometimes when you're afraid of something, it's your instincts telling you, hey, be afraid of that because that thing can kill you. And so to me, that is such a like necessity and a primal thing, a primordial thing, a very base thing. And when we talk about, you know, hierarchies of like mythologies and otherworldly spirits and other medias and other fandoms, the more primordial something, the more basic something is, the more fundamental it is to existence, the stronger it is. For example, if we take D and the D&D world of the Forgotten Realms, the primal planes, which are the planes, the elemental planes, um, their deities that oversee that are called the primals. So it's like the fire primal, the water primal. And those exist to a point of like, they cannot not exist. Like if even if another primal attempted to kill another primal, immediately reality would replace it and reborn a new primal. Yeah, I don't disagree with anything you're saying, but in the Dragon Age lore, it is based on the complexity of the emotion, not necessarily the necessity of the emotion. Right. So I still think pride is more complex than fear because if you really think about it, experiencing the emotion of pride or any of the emotions that kind of go along with it, you have to be experiencing multiple emotions. Like when you're experiencing pride or fear of not um, like being in a high enough place, like being ambitious enough, whatever, you're experiencing fear you're also probably experiencing a little bit of anger for people who are in a higher position than you you might even be experiencing despair if you feel like you can't advance anymore so the pride emotion is very much wrapped up in other emotions as well whereas when you're experiencing fear you might tend to only experience fear Right. I guess my other thing about the complexity of that is like, if we talk about uh, pride and fear as like the strongest hierarchy of demons in their complexity, both can be used for good without changing their essence. So like you can have a sense of pride in yourself that's not like to the detriment of others or in the kind of envy of others with pride. And that is a positive emotion in the same way that like fear can also be something positive. So to me, both are extremely complex because to me, they could exist as just a regular spirit and a corrupted version of what they're having. Yeah. I think that's fair too. Um, but According to the lore, we don't really know where fear fits into this hierarchy. We just know pride is at the top. Um, Correct. So. Well, and then we'll get, I, I know that we're going to get into this because I've looked ahead at our side character, but the strongest demons are interesting. Yes, we'll get there. So we talk about all this stuff with the demons, right? And their, their strength, but ultimately a demon is, is simple. Um, we talk about like the complexity of their emotion, right? But really what they are in their essence is simple. They are essentially a spirit whose purpose has been perverted. That's it. That's what they are. I also think 
And it's a great quote from Solis where he basically says like, so often like wisdom and knowledge turn to pride and uh, despair or something like that. I think you've got it a little off, but yeah, essentially. Yeah. And he basically says like that and you can comment on it, especially, I think if you're a mage or you have the perk, you can comment a special thing. It's like, those sound like demon names and you actually get Solis's approval when you say that. And he's like, it's a very astute observation. So we talked about what demons are and what spirits are. So what is what are the differences and the similarities between the two, right? So technically, a spirit is an umbrella term. It can cover all of them. A spirit, a spirit can be both a spirit and a demon. Um, but a a demon, no, yeah. Wait. Okay, so, well, I got you. I got you. All demons are spirits but not all spirits are demons. Yes. Thank you. My brain is broken. Yes, that's okay. So um, there are benevolent spirits just as there are malevolent spirits. Solus actually argues though, that the terms aggressive and non-aggressive are much more accurate to describe spirits, which I really do agree with. I don't always agree with him, but I do on this. So a benevolent spirit embodies what we would classify as good or noble virtues. They don't wish to cross the veil in and of themselves. And they actually tend to pity immortals who are quote trapped outside of the fade. So benevolent spirits come in five widely known types. These include compassion, valor, justice, faith, and hope. And we will talk about all those in their own episodes but those are the five widely known types of spirits and there are more, but those are the big ones. So if you are a person or if you're mage and Thetis and you pull a spirit unwillingly into the mortal world, particularly to achieve a goal of yours that is out of line with the spirit's nature, it 100% of the time will change that spirit into a demon. On the other hand, if a spirit passes willingly through the veil into the material world, it will not be changed. And then furthermore, if you are in the fade and you are a person and you are anticipating seeing a demon, you are going to see a demon. Even if that entity is a spirit, you're going to see a demon because it's what you are manifesting. Mm -hmm. And as we know from earlier in this episode, Both spirits and demons can change their form. They can appear as whatever they want to really. So if you are thinking, okay, I'm going to see a demon. I'm going to see a demon. I really don't want to see a demon. You're going to see a demon. Also, a spirit who is possessing someone may also be twisted by its host, which then turns them into a demon as well. Such is the case with Justice and Anders becoming vengeance. So there are a lot of different ways that spirits can become demons. And usually this happens. Um, Usually spirits can only cross over the fade by attaching themselves to something in the mortal world. And spirits and demons can both do this. Um, And typically this is a possession. However, some spirits can be drawn into the world and made created against their will like they can be drawn into the mortal world without really wanting to leave the fade this basically drives them mad um, and puts them into a state of shock and even really the waking world terrifies them which then (laughs) results in them becoming unintentionally violent and then turn into a demon so almost anything can make a spirit turn into a demon whether it's shock or making them do something that's against their nature, all of these things can turn them into demons. And that's, I think why the Chantry especially has such an aversion to working with spirit magic at all. Mm. Well, it, and it just comes like, if I was in the Chantry and like studying their history and how they do that, I would think that too, because any, in the history, any time that the fade and the material world intersect in any way, catastrophic and terrible things happen. Yeah, yeah. 
Like the blight. Like the blight, <laughs> exactly. Like Solus and his claims. Right. And I think that how angry Solus gets about spirit, like people binding spirits. Um, and that how he, like he won't even do it when a spirit is asking him to do it. Right. How angry he is at these mages who take a spirit of wisdom and it turns to pride. Yeah. Like, because it, yeah. Go ahead. They ask it to like attack the bandits or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And so it makes me think, like, at least according to Solus, like a spirit's like base intention, base nature is not to be violent. Exactly. It's not. It's not. So, uh, kind of along these lines, I created a list (laughs) because I love lists. If you don't know, I created a list of not quite all the examples, but the main ways that we see in game of spirits becoming demons. So the spirit can already embody something a mortal would perceive as a vice or an ambiguous concept. Example, M. Shale claims he is a choice spirit. However, we can also argue that he is a desire demon. Um, Second, the spirit can reflect or imitate like human perversions of a specific virtue or have a mortal who has conflicting values. Example, justice slash vengeance with Anders. The spirit can also, thirdly, oversimplify the application or fulfillment of its virtue. Example, compassion with coal. Fourth, the spirit may gain ego, ambition, longing, or a thirst for power. The nightmare demon in Inquisition. Fifth, the spirit can be driven insane by outside forces, particularly manifesting into the real world prematurely or against its will. The example of this is the rifts in Inquisition and specifically having all of those demons coming through. And we even see a new type called rift demons. And then my last example is a spirit can be denied its original purpose particularly through blood magic and binding. And this example of this is wisdom in Solus's quest gets turned into a pride demon. Yeah. Do you like my list? I do like your list. <laughs> but in like sometimes, like, I would also say, I feel like Wynn is such an interesting case because like if Wynn had been tranquil, would she have become a seeker? If that spirit of faith would have possessed her? That's really interesting. I don't think so. Um, because in the Seeker Codex, it says that a spirit of faith touches the mind of the Seeker who has been made tranquil. Whereas with when that spirit is possessing her. So when a Seeker becomes a Seeker, they're not being possessed. Their mind is just being touched by that spirit in that time. Right. Does that make sense? It's a very, very minute mm-hmm. difference. Yeah. It's just interesting because like the way the spirit of faith interacts with when is so different than how compassion and coal intertwine with each other. And maybe yeah. it's because when is alive. I think it is that I also think they are different emotions. Yeah. But like, I feel like the faith spirit isn't like changed or affected at all with their interaction with when. Yeah. It's kind of like the the wind spirit is on a certain time limit and she never knows when that spirit's going to give up and she's just going to die. Mm-hmm. Whereas like every other spirit has actual things they, they do or happen to them. So right. we can also chalk it up to like, this is an early game concept. Mm. Um, so multiple arguments, I think. Right. Well, speaking well, of well, possession... Yep. While we're on this topic, let's talk about possession. So both spirits and demons do want to join the living, um, but especially demons can't really make sense of the physical world. They're often unable to really tell the difference between someone who's living and someone who's dead. And so because of this, demons do possess corpses. This is why the Chantry has the custom of burning their dead. 
And this is why we often see shambling or devouring corpses in the game. So I didn't know there was a difference between shambling, devouring corpses, all of these things. I had no idea. So I made another list of some things that can we can explain. So when a sloth demon possesses a corpse, that is a shambling corpse. When a hunger demon possesses a corpse, that is a devouring corpse. When a pride demon possesses a deceased mage, that is an arcane horror. And when a pride demon possesses a non-mage corpse, that is a revenant. Interesting. Isn't that fascinating? Yes. I was shook. Um, it's so interesting. Like, it totally explains what happens in Crestwood, 100%. Because, you know, that rift opens up down there in the caverns and old Crestwood's under there and all of those corpses just immediately get possessed. Yeah, you can't see me. um, If you're listening to this, I'm just like violently nodding my head. Yeah, so I I thought this was fascinating. And it also explains um, in Redcliffe, too, all those corpses that the demon kills originally, then they get, you know, reanimated. Mm -hmm. so most demons they will pretty much jump on seize upon anything they consider living and they do that quickly because they want to like preserve themselves as long as they can Um, and the only way to actually exercise a demon without killing its host is to enter the fade and confront that demon directly but this still has some major risks if the host is killed the demon returns to the fade unscathed no issues so we we learn all this first in origins with connor's quest so it can be very risky and mages specifically due to their expanded like experience with the fade and the veil they are in the most danger of being possessed it's unknown why demons prioritize mages as their ideal hosts some people think it's out of convenience since they already have this kind of occult knowledge. Some think it just could be virtue of their magical powers. And then, but regardless of the reason, a demon always attempts to possess a mage when it encounters one, either by force or by making some kind of deal, depending on the strength of the mage. Abominations are the result of a demon possessing a mage. So that's, most of what i have about possession do you have any final thoughts before we wrap this up and move to our side character final thoughts are just like there is much more to demons than we're even just told in games and even if you do read the codex Uh, and i think that every game we're introduced to another thing about demons and it's interesting to me because Bioware, once again, is taking like this very common thing that happens in fantasy things like spirits possessing a corpse or other that and then just kind of turning it on its head of like, oh, well, there's spirits who embody good things and now there's some spirits who are perverted and embody this other thing and there's this sense of possession. Um, in the Inheritance Aragon series, spirits exist. They're not really delved into, but they can create an entity when they possess something uh, called a shade, which is an interesting term, um, which is like a very powerful magic user of spirits who are possessing a sorcerer is what they're called, who summons spirits. And they possess that body and they become immensely powerful. The problem that they say is it's only evil spirits that seek to possess. Whereas in Dragon Age, all spirits can and do possess. Well, all demons do possess. I, I wouldn't say all spirits do, but they can, but yeah. not all spirits want to. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is interesting because shades are in Dragon Age as well. And in Dragon Age, a shade is basically like a demon in its true form, like a demon who hasn't possessed anyone or um, changed its image in any way. So that's interesting to me. And that they look like Geth. <laughs> they do look like Geth. They absolutely do. It's creepy. Yeah. I don't like it. All right. Well, let's move on to our side character. 
so our side character is so obscure. Um, if you, you may not have heard of this one, I don't know, Austin, I know you have, cause I've talked about it before, mm-hmm. but if you, um, if you're not a super fan, and even if you are a super fan, you may not have heard of this one. So our side character today is a person demon named Gax Kang, the unbound. He is encountered in the quaint hovel in Denerim in Dragon Age Origins. And he is a very ancient demon. And he is actually a part of an ancient group of four very unique and very powerful demons. This group is called the Forbidden Ones. So far, we've encountered three out of the four Forbidden Ones. We encountered Gax Kang at the end of the Unbound quest in Dragon Age Origins. We encounter Zebenkek at the end of the Forbidden Knowledge quest in Dragon Age 2. And we encounter Imshale in the Empress Dulian at the end of that quest in Dragon Age Inquisition. The only one of these four ancient demons, the Forbidden Ones, that we have not encountered yet is the Formless One. I think it goes to say, you can pretty much guess, we will see this ancient formless one in DAD. But that is not the most interesting part of this group of demons. The most interesting part about this group of demons is a quote from the Codex, from specifically the Forbidden Knowledge Codex in Dragon Age 2. I'm just going to read this. And Austin, you can tell me your thoughts after I read this, okay? In 4-2 Black is the oldest account of the Forbidden Ones, though most mages consider them a hoax. But someone had to make that first deal, that first contact with the other side. From the unknown mage's account, the first of the mages cast themselves deep in the fade in search of answers and power, always power. They found the Forbidden Ones. Zebenkek, Imshale, Gax Kang the Unbound, and the Formless One. Many conversations were had, and much of the fabric of the world revealed. And thus the magic of blood was born. Even those who consider this folly dare not utter their names. It's interesting because this implies that they are the ones who are responsible for blood magic. Which interesting because other than like the arch demons in the like Chantry Christianity parallel, there's not really like a devil or a Satan figure figure in the Chantry's mythology that comes to oppose the maker to be like an accuser or an opposition. But if these are the ones who give blood magic to the world, I would say that the, these four, these forbidden ones are that opposition. Okay, so the Forbidden Ones, that name should sound like some other name in the lore. The Forgotten Ones. The the ancient elven gods, opposite of the Evanuris, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So there's another codex entry in Dragon Age 2 that comes from the Enigma of Kirkwall codex entry. And this codex entry tells us that the Seekers of Truth in Kirkwall secretly created something called the Band of Three to investigate, among other things, Zebenkek. And basically, the Band of Three is examining and investigating whether or not the Forgotten Ones in the Elven lore are connected to the Forbidden Ones. And so there's a note left by the very last member of the Band of Three. And this is what this person says about Zebenkek, the second ancient demon that we meet. Zebenkek, the forgotten one or demon or whatever it is. Interesting. So what do you think about that? I think that's definitely interesting. Um, It continues to paint this like dark aura around the forgotten ones and like an evilness to the forgotten ones, which... I know that you're probably going to realize, but makes me trust Solus even less because he's technically a part of the Forgotten Ones. Right. Or I, I, I'm never clear. Is he neither or is he both? 
he's both it's interesting like it just like throws in question i have no idea what solace's motives are yeah i don't either and i don't know how much of this even is connected to solace it it it's really interesting this connection between the forgotten ones and the forbidden ones <laughs> because of the implication it has on dad um uh-huh. it leads me to believe that there is a much deeper reason for this and that it's not just oh haha funny side quest like what if i have long said I'm not sure if Solus Solus is going to actually be the big bad of DAD. I have often said to you and even in the show, what if Solus and the Dread Wolf are two separate entities? Like the Dread Wolf is a title that Solus had taken. Right. But what or- if in DAD they're separate again? And either the dread wolf's original form comes back and this is the formless one or, you know, something else like that happens. Um, I think is, is a possibility. I do think it's interesting because it could be that Solus is trying to like hold back this, you know, forbidden one or something that's far dangerous. And like when in conversations with other people, they pointed out a lot of artwork that shows like a wolf, like haunt, like, coming behind solace and it's not that like it's his shadow it's like that it's following him or stalking him and i think that's interesting yeah it is interesting and another thing that's interesting um this comes also from the enigma of kirkwall codex entry it says if this is real then what of the forgotten ones this journey has taken us to many strange places and has made us reevaluate many former truths where will it end Mm. Where will it end, Bioware? Right. And, like, it comes to say that the Forbidden Ones are so powerful. And I think they're just, they have to have some kind of deep connection to the Fade to be that way. Mm -hmm. Um, And it makes sense because, like, the demons that we fight in the crossroads are so much stronger than any other demon that we fight in anywhere else in the game. Well, except for Gax Kang and Zeb and Keck and Imshale. Right. I remember when I, I didn't face Gax Kang in my first playthrough of Origins, but I did in my second because I 100% of the game. And I remember it was like at the end of the game, like I had, I had done a lot of stuff already. It was right before I went to the lands meet and I'm finishing up some stuff and I went to fight this, you know, finish the Unbound quest. And I honestly was not expecting this fight and it was it was the hardest fight of the game for sure um I I mean I had to try it like two or three times it is so difficult and that's Mm -hmm. like my next point in the notes is that Gax Kang even outranks the high dragon um if you look in the heroic achievements or heroic accomplishments under the character record in Origins it outranks the high dragon under the most powerful foe defeated so he's the hardest demon in the game. It's, I, I mean, it's harder than the arch demon. It's harder than the low game fight. It's harder than the high dragon, which mm. it, it should be if if the lore is this connected. If if these demons are this ancient that they taught blood magic to humanity, they should be the most powerful foe we ever face. Yeah, and it comes back to like we've kind of hit on all of your your final points a little bit um but it yeah. just kind of hits on this a little bit that when you beat him it says the unbound revenant gax king has defeated and sent back to the fade which makes like he's the only demon that that says that about like can they be defeated right maybe that's why Solus creates the veil because these forbidden ones can't be defeated and the veil is the only thing that held them back but then why would he want to tear down the veil? Because he thinks the world needs to be destroyed and made anew. Maybe he yeah, thinks that he can destroy the world and then remake it without the forbidden ones. I think that's major hubris, but yeah. Well, what's his name mean? I know, I know. It means pride. Right. Uh, I think it could also be that it's all a deception and the dread wolf has taken over and they want to bring down the veil to bring the other forbidden ones into the world. Yeah. But it's also interesting that one last point I think that we should talk about is like the stages of the fight and that all the strongest demons we fight can take 
different forms of demons. Um, if we think about the sloth demon in um, the mage quest in Origins, when you fight it, it fights in dis- different stages. It changes demons th- throughout all the demons that are like its underlings in the Fade. Imshale does too. Imshale does too. You fight him as a pride demon, a terror, a fear demon. Despair too, right? I think so. And then Dax Kang switches between horror and revenant, which are the two strongest like classes of fighting, especially in Origins. Reverence and arcane horrors are nightmares. But it's just interesting and like shape changing is so synonymous with the fade that even like when you the warding goes, you get the power to shape change. Yeah, that's true. So that's that's all I have about Zebin Keck unless, or about Gax Kang and the rest of his little cronies, unless you have anything else you want to add. Right. Um, I will say we're probably going to be talking about the other two in future episodes. Yeah, we'll talk about M. Shale next week. Zebin Keck, we don't know enough about him to get his own yeah. slot, but yeah. D- definitely interesting and a lot of interesting like evils in the world and like I feel like we haven't gotten to like for comparison like with Mass Effect there's all these little villains and then you have the Reapers who are like the big big bad like I feel like we haven't got to that in Dragon Age other than like the Blight. Yeah yeah you're right um it's very much been more individual Mm -hmm. so villains yeah It'll be interesting. All right. Well, thank you for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. As always, you can find us on Twitter at DA Lorecast. If you have any lore questions, topics to unpack, or side character suggestions, email them to us at DALorecast at gmail.com. The Dragon Age Lorecast is a part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club. You can join the Robots Radio Network Discord by clicking the link in our episode description. If you enjoyed our show, we'd love it if you'd subscribe and give us a review. See you next time. I'm your host, Maverick Stone. It's me, Gingerino42. I'm Romer. Hey, this is Sassy Lady. And I'm Jaxus. And we... We are the Fallout Roundtable. Join us as we explore various topics from the Fallout universe brought from multiple perspectives. We can be found on your favorite podcatchers from Spotify to iTunes. Or follow us on Twitter at FalloutRTB or our email FalloutRTB at gmail.com. Be sure to rate, follow, and subscribe. Thank you.